Hello and welcome. Today I have the pleasure to be with Professor Michael Spence, Nobel Prize in Economics and Professor Emeritus and former Dean at Stanford Business School. Welcome and thank you so much for being with us, uh, Professor Spence. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's definitely our pleasure and thank you for your time. And what I would like to discuss with you is mostly what's happening now, this uh, new post-COVID reality, this new post-COVID world, and also what your outlook is. What's your vision, actually, uh, at this point in time? Well, this uh, maybe we should start where we are now. So this has um, been a very, very large negative shock. Um, pretty much everywhere in the world. The magnitudes vary, um, but uh, one of the results of that shock is that um, governments have had to respond to try to protect people and households, um, and they've done that with <coughs> very large programs. And I think of it as transferring the balance sheet damage with, which goes with a shock of this size to the sovereign balance sheet, to the government's balance sheet because it's easier to handle there. So nobody likes having a huge amount of incremental debt on the, on the government's balance sheet, and that has consequences down the road. Um, but it's probably better than letting a whole lot of households starve and a whole lot of businesses fail. So I think on balance, what's been happening after, after the start has been generally in the right direction. Virtually everyone, except a few Asian economies, missed the virus when it was in its early stages. And so we lost the opportunity uh, to deal with it there. That's, that's, as Americans say, water over the dam. So there's nothing you can do about it. Um, I think looking forward, you know, we're, we are in for a difficult recovery. Some of it will go quite quickly for sectors that can recover quickly. Some manufacturing sectors can recover quickly. But sectors that require a lot of people to be, get, to get, to be near each other, like hotels, restaurants, hospitality, airplanes, and air travel, <clears throat> those are going to take longer until people are re really fairly sure it's safe. And so I think, I think we're in for a recovery that it, it, you know, at least will take us well into next year, unless there's some miraculous intervention on the therapeutics or, or vaccine front. If you go past that, you know, the central banks have um, partially reversed direction from the pre-pandemic era. They were inching in the direction of normalization of interest rates. They reversed that. And they did it mainly, I think, to support the economies, but to, to make the buildup of government debt that, that we've seen um, affordable, right? So here in Italy, our, we started at 130% sovereign debt to GDP ratio. We'll come out at, the estimates are 160 or more percent. Um, if we had a, you know, an uptick in yields uh, of significant magnitude, it would put, you know, unsupportable stress on the public sector finances. So I think the central banks, the Fed, the ECB, are going to be in the business of keeping interest rates at a very low level for a long time. And that has consequences for all kinds of things. Uh, you know, investors can expect that those low interest rates to tilt the scales in the direction of you know, equities. This is a sort of a, a kind of repeat of what we saw in the post-2008 uh, period with the GFC. So that, that's a little bit. I mean, there's some sectors that we may want to talk about that have experienced significant accelerations, uh, especially the digital ones that have been an important part of the resilience response. And those sectors, I think, you know, I mean, one scenario would be, well, you go back to normal and that won't, that won't last. I don't. I, I think I certainly don't subscribe to that view. I some. I think some of this change will actually stay in healthcare, in education, and working from home, and a whole bunch of other dimensions. The, the tricky part is figuring out how much will we go back to where we were, and, and how much will will it be the same? But uh, but so there's some you know there's some bright spots in this. But but the bottom line is it's it's tough. I mean we could. I'll let you. I'll turn it back over to you. But we could take a tour of the geography because the impacts are different when you go around the world. Yes, please. I would like to talk to, to you and, and to hear again your, your vision, your outlook about this new pandemic economy and what has happened so far in this 2020. At the same time, you were talking about the GFC, the Great Financial Crisis of 2008. Can you also tell us you know, how different this crisis 
that crisis um, was provoked by what, what you might think of as, you know, big imbalances and problems in balance sheets. Um, so in America and a number of other places, it was the household sector that, that uh, got into trouble. Um, and then the whole financial sector followed because they'd been issuing mortgages that weren't soon to be there. Um, and, and, uh, and in Europe, it was, you know, uh, excess debt and nervousness about um, ability and willingness to, to uh, stand behind that debt on the sovereign side, um, particularly in the southern countries in Italy. This is really very different, right? This is, this is an external shock that wasn't generated internally. I mean, unless you think the virus is part of the economy, which I don't. Uh, and it's the closest thing I can think of um, that's analogous is what, what happened in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, the attacks on the World Trade Center and, and the Pentagon and other things. And what happened, people were just shocked. Um, and they thought, we don't know what's happening. And they were scared and they stopped doing things. Um, they thought they stopped flying. I mean, Hawaii nearly went, went, nearly went out of business um, in the post 9-11 period. This is much bigger um, and broader in scope globally and in terms of sectors and so on. But it's the same idea, which is, you know, partly by policy and partly by just being scared. Um, we pushed the pause button on a very large amount of the economy by shutting businesses down and by taking the demand away. And so in principle, if you look back at the 9-11 incident, if, the, if people's expectations or fears or something are, are, are fairly quickly allayed, you could get a very rapid recovery from this um, or a fairly rapid one. Now, let me qualify that. Okay, if this thing goes on for too long, then it's going to leave balance sheet damage of the type that we saw, not the same, but similar, as we saw in the great financial crisis. And balance sheet damage, you don't recover from as quickly. So I think the jury is really out. If we can get out of this sometime in 2011, the residual effects on gov governments, on sovereigns, on businesses that really couldn't make it and so on, They'll be there, but they won't be enormous. If it goes on longer than that, then I think, you know, then we're starting to, the, the, the scenarios start to converge, if I can put it that way. So we are looking at 2021 for the possible return to growth. Uh, but in the meanwhile, as you said, let's also talk about geography, because this is a crisis that is much it's, it's broader than the one that we had um, you know, with 9-11 and probably also 2008 because 2008 came kind of in, in, in chance. You know, it was more gradual according to geographical areas, while here it seems to be kind of widespread at the same time. Is this the difference between this crisis and the other crises we've seen around the world, actually, even in the last century? Yeah, it is. I mean, <clears throat> well, you know, I mean, in, in magnitude, this is more like the Great Depression, right? And many people have said that, uh, and probably in scope as well. Um, in the great financial crisis, the major hit came initially to the developed countries in North America and Europe primarily. Why? Because it, <clears throat> they were the ones with the financial imbalances and the... Um, and, uh, uh, so de sovereign debt problems and so on. <clears throat> the developing countries actually did pretty well in that, in that episode. They were affected because trade fell off and they are dependent on trade. Um, and there were some other things that are more minor. They didn't seem minor at the time, like trade financing dried up uh, because the major players in trade finance were the European uh, financial institutions or a subset of them. Um, but by and large, and but the the the, the uh, developing world didn't hold toxic assets. So if you fast forward to this crisis, it's literally everywhere, right? So you have the virus spreading in waves, Asia, developed countries, and now the developing countries. Uh, the, the hit is is differential, but very large in all of them, and maybe bigger in the developing countries because they're. Uh, resources, fiscal resources, medical resources, and other resources are, are much more limited 
than those of us who have the privilege of living in richer countries. Um, and so I think we're looking at, <clears throat> you know, I don't know what, I don't want to over exaggerate, but major damage pretty much across the whole global economy. If you look at, you know, where it's likely to be least, it's probably Asia. Because the some of the Asian economies caught the virus early, I mean, not everybody caught the virus, but stopped it <laughs> early enough. Um, and so their contractions are have been less. The Chinese contraction was very large because of the aggressiveness of the attack, but because they were pretty successful, it seems, um, the recovery has been relatively rapid. I wouldn't call it a V um, because there's still this trailing edge so that, that everybody's going to have to deal with. But but uh, probably Asia on, on balance is, is um, looks like it'll bounce back more quickly. Now, if you know there's a virus that's distributed globally, um, the bounce back, you know, could be a lot faster than what I or anybody else am saying. We will. We don't want to fool ourselves. I want. I want to just you know caution, um, uh, you know, the participants and and investors and others. We can return to growth fairly fast. You know, if we've got the virus under control, but growth is different from recovering from the contraction we experienced, right? You know, if we went down 20%, we've got to grow a fair amount just to get the back to where we were. So we may see positive growth well before we see what most people, you know, normal people out on the street would think of as a full recovery with normal rates of unemployment and so on. Exactly, and this is an important point. The most important thing now is to return to invest. Because at the moment, I think that risk aversion is really uh, an issue here. No, I agree with that. I think the best way to, at least uh, the way I find it most useful to think about that is in terms of sectors, right? So you already have investment acceleration in a number of digital sectors that have been essentially beneficiaries of the pandemic economy. Um, that includes e-commerce. It includes a wide swath of, you know, mobile payments and fintech. It includes, you know, uh, various aspects of healthcare. It includes various parts of the education sectors looked at globally. I mean, there's a lot, there's several unicorns in the education space whose development has, you know, been accelerated by this. On, on the other hand, if you look at airlines, the last time I looked, um, the index for the American airline group was down at its lowest level 60% from the start of the year. Um, and now, last time I looked, it was down 40%. So are we going to see an investment in that sector? Probably not. In fact, it looks like from news reports that we're going to see disinvestment. Uh, I read one article, I, I, don't, I can't verify it, but that Lufthansa will retire the entire three, three, you know, Airbus 380 fleet. So this is kind of not, this is not investment, right? Um, so I think it, I think it's really sector dependent, and it's a little bit ge geography dependent. Governments can help if they focus some of the recovery efforts on investments that you know get people back to work, but have longer term payoffs in terms of growth you know, green growth, sustainable growth, and so on, um, that would help. We, you know, as you well know, we have the, the European Recovery Fund here, and we're in the midst of discussing how to use it in various countries, including, including this one. Um, so, you know, we haven't got, a, got that all done, but that, but that could certainly help in terms of the recovery, and part of it really should be invested. But here is a question, actually, because obviously we know uh, all kind of governments around the world are helping. Uh, there are stimulus, there are all kind of uh, interventions and uh, big institutions, and first of all, central banks. But do you think that the uh, so-called whatever it takes is really in place? Or do you think they could do uh, more, governments, institutions? Could they have done more? Could they do more? Or they are really doing everything? possible well, I wouldn't say everything because that's a pretty strong word but I mean these uh, but on 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 a on a scale of kind of one to ten I think they're sort of up around eight I mean these are pretty aggressive programs given the the initial condition so I'm disinclined to fault governments uh, on this if there's fault and this does vary a lot 
from place to place. Now, I think the fault lies more in failures with respect to virus um, containment. And uh, that would be especially true in the United States, where there's been a lack of, le le a lack of leadership at the, at the central government level. Um, that doesn't mean, you know, all the government, state and local, have got, walked off the stage. That's not true. Um, but, but I think that there, you know, historians looking back at this will find that the uh, decisions that were made, um, apart from a big fiscal stimulus and accommodative monetary policy about virus control specifically, um, were were not ideal. For example, in Italy, uh, once the government got the the got you know figured out this was really serious. Uh, they locked down the country, they locked down the north, but shortly after the whole country, and they banned non-essential interregional travel. In the United States to this day, they have not banned interstate travel. So the virus is spreading because people are still free to move around. So that's an example of what I was just talking about. So I think that, and, and in general, the handling of the virus in the West has been less successful than in Asia, in part, because the Asians had previous viruses in the re relatively recent past, and they had practiced, you know, how to do it. <laughs> and they had institutions and, you know, capabilities that, uh, that we didn't have, that we were sort of making up as we went along. So uh, they also use digital technologies in a way, some of them, in a way that we're not willing to use them, at least not yet, um, because of concerns about privacy trust of government and other institutions that have big piles of data and so on. So, so that, that there, there, that's where I think, uh, you know, I mean, there's lots of small flaws, okay, that have been uncovered by this. Um, let me give you an example. Unemployment, you know, on, in, in, in the United States, unemployment claims, un, unemployment insurance claims just spiked, right? They went through the roof. They went from normal of a few tens of thousands in some, you know, or even less in some states to, you know, 200,000 a week or 300,000. Well, those things are supposed to get processed in online digital systems and, and those digital systems just collapsed, right? That's, they weren't set up to handle that kind of volume, but that's a fixable problem. I mean, you know, people know about cloud computing systems where you can get, you know, a huge amount of incremental capacity when you need it. Um, and so I think, you know, I don't know if those things will get fixed, but they were, they were flaws that made life pretty difficult for the institutions that were trying to get help from the government. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't a flawless performance by any means anywhere, but, uh, and, and similarly, we had peak load problems in our healthcare systems. Um, that we probably will, in the post-pandemic period, will we'll want to assess, will will want to, uh, you know, um, deal with, unless there's somebody out there who thinks this isn't going to happen again. And but I, if there is some such a person, I haven't run into him or her. And what you said actually is uh, is true when it comes also to how different now, or at least it has been so far, and probably is going to be in the next future. You know the way. Uh, Eastern economies and Western economies are dealing with this, mostly regarding the digital, um, you know, uh, habits and the, the, the digital experience and everything. Now, this said, how do you think the new world of economics and finance is going to shape up? How crucial is going to be now to be digitally advanced? Because we, we know everything is going to be done it has been done so far in the past few months digitally and it's going to be like this in the future probably even this working from home uh, probably offices are going to disappear almost at least and there's going to be a whole change probably not only in economies but also in finance and in, in social life what do you think about that well it's, a, it's very hard to get it you know for anybody to, to kind of be absolutely precise about that but i think you're right I mean, the, the digital, um, the transformation of our economies to digital, substantial digital foundations was well underway before. It's been going on for the last 20 years and it's probably been accelerating. Um, the pandemic has surely accelerated that. Uh, 
or, you know, people have conducted experiments that they didn't, you know, wouldn't have conducted in normal times because that's the way people and organizations are. They're just, it's a known bias. Um, people under experiment. And when they experiment, they learn and they find new things. Like maybe it isn't so bad working from home three days a week or something like that. And so I think there's real change coming. You know, there's sectors where the institutions are extremely conservative and slow moving, like education sector. Uh, and I think this is going to, you know, produce major, major changes in that. And depending on where you are, there may be a whole lot of uh, failures, right? I mean, I would expect to see in the relatively fragmented higher education sector in the United States, you know, a lot of institutions at the margin just aren't going to make it, right? I mean, the benefit and cost ratio is not going to add up for their potential students and you know they're not going to make it um so i think all of those things are true now you know are we going to depopulate new york um as is often kind of speculatively discussed in the media i have no idea i mean i'm a little conservative about that i think that that you know digital technologies have been an important ele element of resilience as you just said um, we're going to pay more attention to resilience. We'll probably use them more. We'll use them more in medicine. But people really like to be together. And so when it's safe, um, then, I, then I expect, you know, the, the, the return to the pre-pandemic patterns of life will be relatively complete. I don't know how to quantify that, Angela, but relatively complete. And Professor Spence, one thing I really would like to ask you also, uh, how crucial is going to be in the next US presidential election? Can something really change in the way this whole crisis is handled? Yeah, I guess so. But I mean, there, I, think, I don't have any doubt that the two, the two, the, two, the president and, uh, and Vice President Biden have, would have very different approaches to, to dealing with the virus and the economy. So yes, the election does matter. Now, um, and, and it matters in a lot of different dimensions. I mean, and one of them may be the dealing with uh, late stages of the virus, hopefully late stages of the virus. And, uh, and I think Biden would provide, just because of who he is and what he said, you know, uh, he would listen to the experts. We'd probably have better information. You know, the Centers for Disease Control, which is like our WHO domestically, would, uh, would I think, have more influence in addition to the state and local officials. Um, but the big change, the, the big <coughs> sort of split in the road, I think, um, with respect to, you know, the way the world functions, including the United States, is the Biden administration is, it'll be focused on a domestic agenda because we, like everybody else, have lots of, of challenges. But the approach to the rest of the world will be uh, different, right? And, and especially the approach to the, rest, the part of the rest of the world that, that we think of as natural allies you know, other democracies and so on. I think it'll just be very much less aggressive and more in the spirit of cooperation. Now, we all know that the international structures that we lived with in the post-war period need modification for all, for all the obvious reasons. We have to deal with climate change. Um, the old rules, you know, are a little creaky. We have to deal more effectively with technology globally than we have, you know, in institutionally up till now. Yeah, so everybody knows that. And that doesn't mean that it'll be easy to get all that done over the next decade or so. But I think this, the willingness to engage in that would be higher in a Biden administration if he, if he were to succeed in the election. And obviously, uh, this, is, this is an issue that's close to you because you are American, but also Professor Spence, you have been living in Italy for a while now. So can you tell us something more about your personal experience of uh, Italy and also of this health crisis, of this pandemic, 
and uh, how do you see uh, actually uh, easily now going forward? Well, so it first of all, it's a wonderful place to live. Uh, it you know it's beautiful and has a wonderful culture. The people are you know very nice. It's family oriented, and it has lots of strengths. There's lots of entrepreneurs here um, that who are are you know very successful and imaginative. There's a lot of creative industries and innovation in 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 in, in a range of sectors, and 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 I think that's. After a slightly sort of sloppy start, I think the government is justifiably getting credit for handling the virus pretty well, right? Relative to others, relative to other European countries. I mean, it was pretty tough, but they were pretty clear. And and it, they got the prevalence of the virus down to the point that it looks like we may be able to successfully open up. I mean, it doesn't look like a ghost town here. There's the restaurants have moved outdoors, which is sort of amusing. Um, and it may happen in other places. The schools seem to have opened in person successfully. Uh, so I think, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of uh, good to be done. And at a slightly more general level, I do think that Europe coming together around an, uh, a recovery fund and financing it with European debt is a really important step forward. Now, whether it turns out to be the start of a process of uh, the right kind of you know, coming together, unification, um, with respect for, you know, national differences. It's too early to tell, but but it, it's a lot better than the post-GFC period and the sovereign debt crisis where the attitude was more or less, you got into trouble, get yourself out of trouble, meaning you're on your own. Uh, so this feels very, very different in that respect. Having said that, this is a country that has registered very, very little growth, if any, for two decades. Right. And that's not a condition that is conducive to sort of, you know, uh, um, social cohesion and a whole lot of other things. So there is a set of real challenges here. It's a mixed picture. Professor Spence, it was really a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for being with us. Professor Michael Spence, Nobel Prize in Economics and uh, Professor Emeritus and former Dean at Stanford Business School. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Um, and I enjoyed the discussion.